Lord, just pray you'd open up our understanding, receive the things that we've heard already, and be able to receive yet something from your hand, in Jesus' name. Amen. As the Lord had a desire to feed his people with the finest of wheat, you know, when he planted a choice vine in his vineyard, the problem wasn't with the vine. The problem was that when he expected it to bring forth good fruit, good grapes, it produced worthless grapes. You know, and in this world, we have many troubles. The cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for pleasure. They can choke the seed and cause it not to bring fruit to maturity. And so it can happen that the one that God planted in Jesus you know, in our hearts, in our lives, we can still remain sour and bitter. We can still not bring forth sweeter and better if we don't endure and overcome. I think of the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is opposite the way of the flesh, the way of the spirit. And there, there are two forces working against one another. The flesh is hostile against the spirit, and the spirit is in opposition to the flesh. You know, and there's a constant battle in the mind. What, what should we do? Which way should we go? And so we're relying on wisdom. But there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction. And so we need the wisdom that comes from God, not wisdom that comes from the flesh, or men of the flesh, or people that seem to be something in the flesh. We need to hear from the Holy Spirit, and we need to hear from people who have wisdom. I think of, in the Bible, there is a time when uh, Jehoshaphat aligned himself with King Ahab. They were brother and brother-in-law, and one was king of Judah, one was king in Israel. And uh, Ahab wanted to go into battle and fight. He invited Jehoshaphat to fight with him. And uh, Jehoshaphat said, well, we should hear from the Lord. Like, Does the Lord want us to go, or does the Lord not want us to go? It's a very important question. In our life, we all should be asking, is this, is the Lord, are you leading me in this direction? Should I really be going in this way, or do you want, not want me to go this direction? Well, Ahab says, okay, we'll call the prophets. And, you know, everybody likes a good prophet. Well, they had like 400 of them. And they all told uh, Ahab what he wanted to hear. Oh, you should go into the battle, and you're going to have the victory. But something didn't sit right in Jehoshaphat's heart. Something was not sitting right. And he said, do you have any more prophets here? It's like, well, what are you talking about, man? We've had 400 of them come, and they've all given us the green light. We're going to go into this battle. We're going to have the victory. He says, there's one more prophet. His name is Micaiah. But he always tells me what I don't want to hear. He always says the things that are against me. It's like, I hate that man, is what he said. Joseph said, you shouldn't speak that way. This is not good. So he called him, and sure enough, he told him what he wanted to hear, but he says, don't lie to me. He says, tell me by the Lord. And he says, if you go into battle, you're going to die. Because the Lord sought to kill Ahab because he was wicked in his generation. You know, when he tried to disguise himself and he tried to save his life, he did go into the battle. And you know what? A stray arrow struck him. And he did die on the way. Ahab perished there. We don't want to hear the truth. We would rather listen to 400 false prophets who tell us what we want to hear than someone who will tell us the truth. Because our heart is already made up when we're in the flesh on what we want to do. And rather than listening to the Lord and coming under the authority of the Lord in our life. And this is what can happen to us if when we're young, we don't learn the discipline that comes from our fathers and from our mothers. I'm going to exhort you dads and moms, that you be consistent in walking with the Lord and teaching your children to come under the yoke. It says that it's good that we bear the yoke in our youth. Otherwise, your children will become like Ahab. They will hate authority. When God's authority comes in their life, they will speak against it, and they will come to hate the men of God. We have a stewardship and responsibility not to allow our children to run wild and go crazy, but that they would be and orderly and respectful to others and to us as parents. Because unless they come to learn that, hard life awaits them. And it says if you don't 
correct your son or your daughter in a proper way, you hate your son. These are strong words from scripture. It doesn't matter the way that we were brought up. Sometimes we're brought up too strict. And so we go the opposite direction and we say, well, we're going to let them do what they want and leave it to God. No, my friends. It says if we spare the rod, we spoil the child. And there's many other scriptures we could read about that. It is important for them to bear the yoke in their youth, to learn discipline. We need to kiss the son lest he be angry with us. And so this is our duty and responsibility to uh, help nurture them and to correct them and discipline them in the ways of the Lord. Which son is there that God does not discipline? Are you without discipline before God? I would say absolutely not. We heard from Brother Dan that the worldly people are without discipline. Their time is always down. But yet our time, it seems as though God is restraining us from going headlong after the flesh. And he's constantly correcting us and dealing with us as sons. Why? Because if he disciplines us as sons, he loves us. And he said, which father does not discipline or correct their children? You know, now our fathers have disciplined us in ways and we can all think back that are not good. So they maybe let us get away with things for a while until the anger came and then they struck us and did things in a wrong way. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being consistent, being uh, around, being a part of the nurturing of those children's lives. Both father and mother being on the same page to nurture and correct their children in the way that they should go so that they come under that authority to learn that, uh, that submission to authority. So when they are older, they do not become brute beasts like it speaks of in Jude. We have that responsibility. You know what? I had one brother and he thought, you know what? I'm, I, he got into a, a battle with his son and he just went, I'm going to win this battle. And I, I, I had to talk to him because it's like it's not about one battle. It's about the war. You know, just because you might lose one battle with your son or your daughter. It doesn't mean that you have to win every single battle. You know, we, we allow the Lord, we pray for our children, you know, and we just continually through persistence, can continual doing the right thing and, and speaking life into them and sharing the word of God with them and correcting them in the best way that God leads us. That in the end, if you teach your child in the way that they should go and do it properly, then when they were older, they won't depart from it. But if you teach them that they can be wild and free and unrestrained, that when they're older, they will become wild, restrained, and uncontrollable, not submitting to any authority. We have a window when our children are growing up, and every one of them is different. There's not one shoe fits all. Everyone is different. To bring about a correction, to produce in them humility, to produce in them a brokenness, uh, a yielding of the will. And it has to happen. It starts at two years old. When they look at you and they know what they're doing, and they take the food, and they throw it on the floor, and they laugh in your face, there has to be a correction. And this correction has to go on until they become teens. And then the Lord has to take over from there. But we have a responsibility and a stewardship. Because, you know, there's a way that seems right to a man. And some of us think, you know, we're just, we're doing our own thing and we're busy and we're doing this and we're doing that. And some people only discipline when they get angry. You know, both are wrong. Being present, loving your children, teaching them the word of God and also correcting them according to the word of God. And if you're not sure how to do it, receive counsel. Because I've done it wrong and I've also done it right. And the way that I used to do it, I was too severe. But you know what? You can also become too lenient. And so you have to come up with a way that the Lord leads you and teaches you how to correct them based on how the Lord has corrected you along the way. And when you're faithful and consistent and loyal in that regard, then those scriptures from Psalm 78, that your righteous life will translate to that next generation and your children will walk in integrity and uprightness. You know, I wanted to share a passage. From uh, Luke in chapter chapter 20. Luke in chapter 20 in verse 9. You see what happened when Jesus came on the scene. That the religious leaders who were in charge. The people feared them. 
And they also at times feared the people. You know, they had reputation and they were doing things, what they thought was according to the word, but they were doing things according to their interpretation of what they thought the word said. And what began to manifest is that the Pharisees were lovers of money, that the Pharisees were proud, that the Pharisees were rebellious. And when the word of God came, the prophets came and spoke that word, they had hearts like Ahab. They hated the word of God, even though they said that they themselves were guides to the blind. And what we see here in this passage is a manifestation of unrestrained, unfettered flesh, that these men were rebellious and proud and would not submit to the authority in their life. They became an authority. And this is a dangerous place that we can come to when we start thinking that we have the word of God and we are the final authority, that we will say things to people we will treat people in a certain way. We will respond to people according to pride and bitterness, anger. And uh, we won't submit to any authority in our life. And that will bring us to the book of Jude. And this is a very dangerous place that we as believers can come to if we do not learn to take the yoke that Jesus says. He says that we ought to take my yoke upon you. In the same way we said that, that little children should learn to bear their yoke in their youth. We have to take the yoke. Jesus calls us to be yoked together with him, joined heirs with Christ. And he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me and learn of me, for I am humble and gentle in heart. We have to not become proud, rebellious, and strong, but to become humble and gentle in heart. How does that happen? When we learn to take the yoke, we submit ourselves under the dealings of the Lord, the discipline of the Lord, and become humble, broken, and contrite. This is the way that leads to life. This is the way of God. Jesus said, for I am humble and gentle in heart. When we take his oak, you will become humble and gentle in heart. But the opposite of that is proud, loud, rebellious. This is not the way of the cross. This is not the way of the gospel. We have to be careful that we don't become brute beasts, having resisted the brokenness that comes from the dealings of God in our life. So he says in Luke in chapter 20 and verse 9, he says, he began to tell the people a parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, and he leased that vineyard with this choice vine that we spoke of earlier to uh, some vine dressers. He leased it to them. It wasn't theirs. It was on loan to them. They had a stewardship. And this is speaking about those of us who've been called to ministry. God has entrusted us with a stewardship. In the same way, you fathers, you've been trusted with a ministry over your family. We have a stewardship to deal with this, the vineyard and the vines that are sprouting around all our tables, like olive plants. We have a stewardship to do things according to the word of God. And it says that this, uh, this uh, farmer, this landowner, he went to a far country for a long time. In verse 10, now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Now the servant that went to the vine dressers to go and get some of the fruit was one of the prophets. This was one of the men of God who came seeking good fruit from those vines, but they decided that they were going to keep it for themselves. And this is something dangerous that can happen. Selfishness, pride, greed, and you know what? They wanted the glory for themselves. They didn't want to give the Lord his portion. They didn't want to give the Lord the first fruits. They didn't want to submit themselves to, to the one who had given them the vineyard to tend. And so this is what Jesus is speaking this parable specifically about he sent his prophets and they made fun of them. They beat them and they sent them away because they refused to submit to the, to the lordship of God in their life. And so again, he sent another servant, another prophet, and they beat him. Which of the prophets did they not persecute? They were proud, rebellious and unrestrained. And so 
They treated this one shamefully, and they sent him away empty-handed. This fruit that the Lord is looking for in our lives, what is it? It's the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace. There was no fruit of the Spirit to be given back to the Lord, no glory and honor going to God. They took everything for themselves. They wanted to receive it for themselves, the glory. And again, he sent a third. They wounded him. They cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, this is what I shall do. I will send my beloved son. Jesus was speaking of himself. He said, I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. And when Jesus comes on the scene, what do they say? Verse 14, when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. They knew that this was the Christ, yet they refused to receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be children of God. They said this, come, let us kill him. Then the inheritance will be ours. You see, it was all about me and mine. It was all about my glory, my reputation, my name, what I want, what I think is right. And they have no problem even killing not just the Lord's prophets, but killing Jesus himself. This is what happens to rebellious, proud people who refuse to receive correction, who refuse to become humble and be broken and allow the Lord to be Lord over their lives. They themselves rise up and take that authority into their own hands. This is a dangerous thing. So they cast Jesus out of the vineyard and they killed him. This is prophesying of what was to come. Jesus is speaking. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Well, he will come and he will destroy those vine dressers. And he will give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, absolutely not. They rejected the teaching of Jesus. This is because they could not submit themselves to the dealings of the Lord in their life. They did not submit themselves to the word of God, which they preached, and they would not submit to the words of Jesus. And so when he looked at them, he said to them, what then is this that is written? Verse 17, the stone that the builders rejected, being Jesus Christ, has become the chief cornerstone. Now, verse 18 is very important. He says, whoever falls on that stone will be broken. But whomever it falls on, that stone will grind them to powder. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken. But on whomever that stone falls, it will grind them to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on Jesus, but they feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken this parable specifically against them. What does that mean? On whomever it falls, on whomever the stone falls. How are we to fall on the stone and be broken? We need to allow ourselves to be broken by the word of God. If we don't come under the authority of the word when it's spoken, when you read the scriptures and you're reading it, not for your neighbor, not for your brother, not for your buddy, you're reading it and it's speaking to you. And it's bringing conviction. You're looking in the mirror and you're seeing what kind of man you are. And you're saying, Lord, I want to be that man. I want to be that woman. Mold me and shape me after that will. And brokenness will come in your life as you submit to the discipline, the correction of the word. But if you refuse to receive the correction of the word and you use this word like a hammer, use this word to like speak and put other people in their place or you use this word to your advantage to gain advantage over others then the time is coming when the rock will fall on you and will crush you into a powder there's two options either you humble yourself and you bear the yoke or you will be kicking against the goats and you will find yourself in a bad way fighting against God and when you're fighting against God you will not win that is 100% for sure. We're finishing in the book of Jude. The book of Jude is right before Revelation. That's 
last book. Spoken in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Brother, sister, if you've come to Christ, you've come because you've had at least a mustard seed. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can never be born again, except you believe on the one whom he has sent. And he says, obey the gospel and believe, you know, keep the commandments of God. And what are the commandments of God? He says, this is the commandment of God, that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility and a stewardship to just have simple, childlike faith. But you know, the ones who are proud, who are wise in their own eyes, who have received knowledge from, from the wisdom of the father of this age, Satan himself, their eyes are blinded. Their minds are blinded. They cannot receive the simplicity of the gospel. And when we preach the cross, it's foolishness because they're perishing. But to us who are being saved, the message of the cross about falling on the rock and being broken, about allowing the Lord to break us, about allowing his discipline to correct us, about denying ourselves, about dying to what we're held by, our passions and our desires, our lusts, about putting off the old man with his lusts and sins, repenting of sins and coming to him as a little child in simple childlike faith. These things are foolishness to them that perish. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so there is a reminder in Jude that we have to come to him simply in childlike faith and just believe that he is. That You have to believe that he's for you. You have to believe that he's going to work all these things together for your good because you love God. But having begun in the faith, it can happen that we can forget and we can go in another direction away from the faith. And this is why he's writing this. While well, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to exhort you to contend, fight for the faith. Don't let it go. Keep going in faith. Keep trusting the Lord. Don't trust in your righteousness. Don't trust in your wisdom. Don't trust in how much scripture you already know. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he'll bring it to pass. So he says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed. What does that mean to creep in unnoticed? Where were they creeping in? These certain men were creeping in to their church. These certain men were creeping into their Bible studies. They were creeping into their prayer groups. There's, that's where they were creeping in. They were trying to get in there, and they had a pretense that they were of the faith, that they were godly. But what does the fruit begin to manifest show us? Certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago, God said, were marked out for condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of God into a license to sin, into lewdness. They deny the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, he saved them out of the land of Egypt. He brought them into the wilderness. But what does it say here? Afterwards, the Lord destroyed those who did not continue in the faith. We have to continue in the faith, to contend for the faith, to press on in the faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now he says, the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but they left their abode, he has reserved under everlasting chains and darkness for that great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in the same manner, gave themselves over to sexual immorality, went after strange flesh set up examples of suffering, of vengeance, eternal fire. So we can begin in the faith, and then we have another way worked out, and what manifests? Sin manifests. And so we become soft on sin, we start holding fast to the promises, we start telling ourselves we're king's kids, that we're elect, and we're still living however we please. We don't, we take the yoke off. We're not humble and gentle in heart anymore. Take the yoke off and we start becoming unrestrained, you know, and we start uh, leaving the proper abode like the like these angels left their proper domain. 
And they began to go, they had another way worked out. And that led them into a bondage under everlasting darkness and chains for the judgment of the great day. In the same way Sodom and Gomorrah, they were given over to sexual immorality. Whenever you get out from underneath the yoke and you start to walk in your own ways, then sin manifests and you have another choice. You either claim that you're eternally saved while you're practicing sin, or you have to look in the mirror and you have to say, there's something wrong with me. Rather than stiffen up and become proud and continue on in rebellion and witchcraft. Likewise, these dreamers, verse 8, these certain men, they defile the flesh, right? They're men of the flesh. They're fleshly, carnal, worldly, rebellious. They reject authority. This is the fruit of it. They reject authority. They won't submit to sound counsel. They do their own thing. That's why it's good that children submit yourselves to your parents and the Lord. This is right. Even though the, we as parents make mistakes sometimes, but the scripture also says as parents were not to be harsh and dishearten the children, that's an exhortation to us from God. But we have to submit ourselves and learn this thing. Even if you come under a harsh boss or you're under a harsh uh, authority figure in your life, allow the Lord to break you there. Come under the yoke. Learn of him because the Lord knows exactly where you're at. And he'll, uh, he'll bring work good things in your life through it. These who reject authority, then they also, they speak evil of dignitaries. They have no problem just calling out brothers and just putting them in their place and just making accusations and saying things. This is very dangerous when we take the yoke off and we no longer want to be broken. We no longer want to come under the lordship of the word of God. We begin to rise up in pride and rebellion and greed. This is what it says, even Michael, the archangel, when he was contending with seed himself over the body of Moses, he did not say, you foul devil. You know, he did not make accusations about what he had done, you know, and how foolish he was and how wicked he was and how unclean he is. And he didn't swear at him and put him in his place. All he said to him, he said he would not bring a reviling accusation against him. He wouldn't dare. He just said, the Lord rebuke. I'm not going to rebuke you. The Lord rebuke. You see, Michael had a fear of God. If we lose the fear of God, then we begin to just say whatever comes to our mind. We'll say anything to anyone at any time just because we can. That is dangerous, my friends. And we have to be careful that our hearts don't go there. He says, these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they do not know naturally, whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. What did Cain do? Cain brought a sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord didn't accept it. They got angry. What did Abel do? Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. He was accepted. He was blessed. And Cain becomes so angry, the only thing that he could do is take out the competition. And so he slew his brother in the field. They have gone the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. It'll go in another direction where we'll start loving money. We'll start preaching the gospel for money. We'll start doing certain things for money. Everything will be all about selfishness. What I want, my needs, my desires, my will, my way. And they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. These were men of God. Korah, he was a Levite. He had been given a stewardship. They were in charge of the tabernacle. And they had certain service there. And then Korah challenges Moses' authority. And he says, hey, we are from God too. Who died and made you ruler over us, so to speak. And Moses fell on his face before God. And he said, the Lord will judge between you and me. And you know what? The, the Lord dealt with Korah and his family. He dealt with those rebellious Levites who were set apart for the service of God. May the Lord help us to get some healthy fear, lest we go outside of what God has called us to, and we become proud and rebellious and haughty. We need to be careful in this regard. I'll skip to verse 16. He says, they're grumblers and complainers, walking according to their own lusts. 
They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostle of the Lord Jesus. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are soulish persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. May the Lord help us not to become like these men. While they feast with you without fear in the fellowship, they have no fear of God because they have another way worked out. And I finish here. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. We need to strengthen ourselves in the faith. We need to be built up in the faith. We need to become rooted and established in the faith. It says praying in the Holy Spirit. Always meditating on the things of God. Mindful of his will and his ways. Keep yourself in the love of God. If you're not kept in the love of God, then you will not have love for the brothers. If you are not walking in covenant with God in a right way, you will not have love for the brothers. It's that simple. Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, on some, we need to have compassion, making a distinction. Because sometimes we can become rebellious, and that's where we need to say, hey, brother, you know, be careful that you don't go the way of Cain here. Be careful that you don't perish in the rebellion of Korah here. We need to humble ourselves. We need to continue to maintain the unity of the spirit here and the bond of peace till we come to unity of the faith. You know, we're all, we're all nobodies. You know, we're here to worship the Lord and we desire to please him, to serve him. But save others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, even hating the garment defiled by the flesh. The flesh is, is a hostile thing. We need to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. To put off the old man with his lusts. And we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on tender mercies, kindness, and compassion. It's a decision. When you get up in the morning, you're going to put on clothes. You're going to put on your grubby clothes, your work clothes. You're going to put on whatever you're going to put on in the morning. You're going to put on a clean change of clothes. You know, we can either put on the flesh and do things according to the flesh. We can put on kindness and tender mercies and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That has to do with renewing the mind, setting our mind on things above, as Brother Aline shared, not on earthly things. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Who is able to keep you from stumbling? Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless and blameless before him in love, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise. We need wisdom that comes from above, which is first pure, and then peaceable, gentle, and, a, and noble, and a, you know, good report. So God alone is wise. His word is, is wisdom. And we need the Spirit to understand that word and to quicken his word to us, to humility. To God be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. May the Lord help us to become like Jesus, to be conformed into his image. Transformed as stars differ in their brightness from glory to glory. Only he's able to make it happen.